Hello, um, good afternoon, everyone from Brussels. Uh, my name is uh, Chibuye Chandwe. I'm a research associate in the migration group at uh, A Path for Europe. And I'm very delighted to see uh, you all participating in this event today. Um, uh, let me introduce uh, PFEU, as well as today's topic and speaker to you first. Um, PFEU uh, is a think tank and was founded in 2020, uh, focusing on the future of the European Union specifically. Our team is exclusively com comprised of uh, young researchers across Europe. I myself, I'm in Brussels, for example. Uh, we conduct research and develop policy advice and want to foster engagement for Europe through debates and talks just like this one we're having today. Um, uh, this web talk is part of our monthly uh, event series, Coffee Conversations, um, if you don't have your cup of coffee. <laughs> And uh, with this conversation, we would like to explore uh, current topics within different EU policy areas. Um, the topic for today specifically is a new pact on migration and asylum. Uh, as in September 2020, the long awaited new pact on migration and asylum was released by the Commission. And the Commission um, promises a fresh new start on migration with this pact, uh, focusing on building confidence through more effective procedures, but also uh, striking a new balance between responsibility and solidarity. Um, the pact introduces uh, modernized procedures for pre entry and border procedures, for example. Uh, but also uh, long-term support and the most novel uh, approach from, from, the, from the Commission is return sponsorship. Uh, I'm very glad to discuss this topic today with uh, Florian Trauner, who is the uh, John Monet Chair at the Free University of Brussels and also the visiting professor at the College of Europe. Um, his research mainly focuses on uh, European integration, no to migration and asylum, but also return and counter uh, terrorism policies. Uh, he also looks at European decision making and especially uh, EU external relations. Um, this talk was actually inspired by a recent discussion paper he, together with Olivia Sandberg Diaz, released on the effects of the new pact. Uh, and really looking forward to uh, have this chat with you on uh, on the pact. Um, for our audience, I would like to ask you to uh, post your questions in the chat. Uh, you can post your name um, or raise your hand and we will uh, invite you to ask your questions at the end. It's a great opportunity to actively uh, join in the conversation. And I know many of you have perhaps joined webinars where this is said, but we really, really would like to have the discussion going and have your, uh, have your input. Um, yeah, so with us, I would like to, uh, I would like to invite Florian. Hello, Florian, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, it's again, such an honor to have you here today to discuss this topic that's ever more relevant. Um, and yeah, I would now like to uh, invite Florian to uh, share his screen because uh, we will first start with uh, Florian giving us a brief presentation or an overview of, you know, the pact uh, so far, just to give uh, our audience uh, an idea of, uh, of where we're coming from. Please, uh, Florian, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, Shibuya. It's, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I'm really quite impressed with what you are doing with the Path of Europe. I think it's a it's a great initiative that young people engage to find new ideas uh, and with the with Europe as a, as a whole, you know. So I, I really appreciate what ah, what you are doing there, and glad to uh, discuss with you. I will right now share my screen. I was told that I have fifty minutes to have an initial presentation, and then uh, we may have a. a a more Q&A style uh, engagement with the topic. So contrary uh, with, uh, I think what you also announced in the in LinkedIn, for instance, yesterday, I really emphasized the question mark at the end of the question, if returns are a solution to European solidarity, that will be uh, uh, the key question today when we discuss this new pact on migration and asylum. So uh, return sponsorships uh, have been probably the pact's most novel element. I mean, there uh, are several other elements in there that will change the, the way in which European policymaking and asylum and migration is being handled. Uh, but return sponsorship was really one of these key items that has not been really foreseen by many observers or, uh, or you know, 
yeah, uh, uh, academics beforehand. So the question is, what is it there and can it actually work in practice? So let's talk a bit uh, of the, the key points of the, the pact uh, to embed it in a, in a context. I mean, post-migration crisis, uh, the EU wanted, the Commission wanted to fully reform the EU's asylum policy, uh, released uh, a whole package of new laws, uh, a core pillar of which was a, a revised Dublin regulation. Uh, Dublin regulation should permanent, uh, 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 should transform an emergency relocation scheme to a permanent relocation scheme. Uh, the Commission's pact right now ends with this mandatory focus on relocation of asylum seekers and says if member states do not want to relocate asylum seekers, they do have a possibility to choose uh, and concretely to choose to engage uh, in migration control and irregular migration. And they came up with a concept called return sponsorship, so taking responsibility for the return of irregular migrants. I'll explain it a bit later. Uh, some other key elements is that much more should happen directly at the border uh, and in a much quicker way, if you want to say so. So there should be a relatively first screening, security screening, but then also a very quick screening if uh, a migrant uh, comes from a safe third country, if a migrant could have found protection already in the route. Uh, uh, it should, you know, uh, 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 happen more at centers in the border uh, and not only, let's say, by Greek or Italian authorities, but also with a very strong support of Frontex personnel of the uh, then empowered European Asylum uh, Agency, currently still called the European Asylum Support uh, Office, but it should be also be empowered. Uh, and Europol has to play a role as well with regard to uh, smuggling uh, and, and gathering data there. And the final element that is very important for the EU uh, is a much closer cooperation with third countries. Uh, I mean, everybody knows the cooperation between the EU Turkey, EU Libya, all the things that are happening there a bit, uh, but the EU is thinking in a much bigger term. They really want to mainstream uh, migration cooperation in a much stronger way in basically uh, the cooperation with most countries of origin and transit, most third countries in general. Uh, uh, and here the Commission also calls for much more both positive and negative conditionalities. So positive conditionality would be more money. Uh, they also have new migration partnerships. Uh, so positive engagement, I give you something if you do something. but. Explicitly, they also call for negative conditionality. So if a third country is not cooperating with the EU, then they face negative uh, consequences, for instance, stricter visa rules for everyone. Uh, so how is this sponsorship uh, concept working uh, precisely? Uh, let's say there is a group of Nigerian migrants found to be uh, ineligible for asylum. So they are directly still, uh, let's say, in Sicily, where they entered uh, Italy asks uh, to the EU uh, who would be willing to take up a return sponsorship, Belgium says they can act it. So the migrants would remain for eight months still in Italy, in Sicily, and the Italian authorities would tell the Belgium authorities, uh, look, what can you do, you know? I mean, we would need, for instance, money for implementing uh, a voluntary assisted return program, you know, or you would uh, can you help us with getting the laissez-faire documents for uh, uh, with the Nigerian authorities, with the Nigerian consulates? Uh, this kind of support, uh, this coordination between Italy and Belgium should be facilitated by a return coordinator. Uh, this is a new position to be created uh, if uh, the pact is adopted. Uh, so this negotiator is a kind of a platform in which these negotiations can take place. So what is the outcome? Uh, one, the return is possible. Then the migrants are directly returned from Italy to Nigeria, possibly with the help of Frontex. Frontex is getting a much stronger return unit there. Uh, or the return is not possible. Uh, and then uh, uh, the next level of responsibility for Belgium kicks in. Uh, the migrants are to be transferred to Belgium from Italy after eight months four months if there is a mass influx of migrants, 
uh, and uh, the Belgium is in, in charge of further dealing with these migrants. So, I mean, they can, the Belgian authorities can try to further go for a return procedure or they can consider eventually a, a regularization or whatever, like uh, a toleration regime. Uh, so this is uh, according to other European or national laws then. So what is the background? Uh, the background is, and here I come back to what I briefly mentioned, this situation post-migration crisis that the EU's asylum system uh, is not actually contributing to a very fair distribution or equal distribution of asylum seekers across Europe. You have some member states that do have quite a high number of uh, uh, asylum applications and some member states that uh, do not have asylum seekers in large numbers. Basically, it's also fluctuating to, to some extent. Hungary certainly is probably uh, uh, one of the most extreme cases, but during the migration crisis, uh, 2015, it had around 177,000. And last year, it had 150 uh, asylum seekers. Uh, but you can see in other countries, it's fluctuating quite a big extent as well. Greece had very low uh, asylum applications. It's, uh, it's increasing right now. It's increasing in France uh, uh, and Italy as well. In Germany, which was during the crisis, a real outlier in absolute numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically no longer uh, having such a big share. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, so it's unequally distributed. Uh, and a, a fairer distribution, the relocation scheme is not working very well. So after the crisis or in the context of the crisis, the EU made this emergency relocation scheme uh, against the vote of some Eastern European countries, uh, but it should help to relieve uh, uh, migratory pressure from Italy and Greece. So it was up to 160,000 uh, migrants to be transferred. It was then reduced to uh, just basically around 35,000 basically, uh, and the commission after all, this is an internal document, some of you, so it's not formal, but they said in the end, we almost achieved 93% uh, of what we wanted to achieve. Uh, but what is actually quite striking is that member states contributed wide, widely in a, in a hugely different way. So you have some member states that uh, clearly overfill the, the quota they are supposed to fulfill and some other member states that do not cooperate on relocation at all, basically. Uh, so this is a bit the, the, the context. You have a very different level of acceptance of relocation. So in this context, the Commission said, then let's give the states what they're asking for. If Eastern Europeans and some Western Europeans ask for restrictive migration policies, then let's give them responsibilities for actually implementing them. Uh, and that's why they basically came up with this return sponsorship. The big question is, can it work? Is it acceptable as well for, for the member states? Uh, so here we can see uh, it's, it's difficult. It's not that uh, this is the concept that has proven already to be right now the, the miracle to solve all the differences uh, from the perspective of uh, cooperation reluctant member states, return sponsorship may be seen as a kind of a relocation through the back door because after eight months, after all, you have to physically bring out the migrants of the EU border state. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Greece, Malta, Italy, they say eight months is a very, very long time period. Uh, it should be much shorter. They call for even, you know, three, four months as a standard, uh, not only as a crisis response. So that's a bit their positioning in the uh, in the negotiation. So there is quite a, a wide gap between uh, these groups of, of member states. For the one, it's too much, for the other, it's not enough. Uh, and then there is the next point is that it's the Commission, given how sensitive migration issues has been, they has said, okay, let's make it relatively flexible. So member states, they can choose if they want relocation uh, return sponsorship. They can choose even within return sponsorship the nationalities they would like to return. Uh, they can also choose, you know, percentages, you know, percentage relocation, percentage uh, uh, return sponsorship, but then also contribute it to some border, border uh, uh, contributions or build up a, 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 a reception center, something like this. So it's, it's relatively vague. Uh, 
uh, and which makes it difficult for border states to actually predict what will come out of this whole mechanism. Uh, and uh, we believe in the paper that uh, Jibuya mentioned in the beginning, there's quite some possibilities to shirk responsibilities uh, and to not do what they're supposed to do. Uh, another point is certainly for migrants. Uh, the whole policy builds upon an implicit assumption that there are a right, a, a quite a harmonized return policy, uh, but you can see that this is not really the case. Uh, give example, uh, some states uh, perceive Afghanistan uh, as a safe country, other states perceive it as a, as a very unstable country. Some countries deport migrants there, others not. Right now, Denmark uh, was in the media last week, they started to discuss and to implement policies to return Syrians to Syria. So you can see the perception of what is happening in third countries differing widely. Uh, and this will also impact in a way how uh, migrants then be returned or what, you know, how it, all these kind of things. So there is unclear accountabilities, responsibilities within Europe. It's, it's not uh, a concept that is, uh, 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 how to say, unproblematic for migrants. And then a the final question is certainly the third countries. The whole commission idea is that uh, return sponsorship shouldn't be such a big issue because the number should be low in a way because uh, 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 I mean the number of migrants to be returned from border countries to other countries should be low because most of the migrants to be returned should be returned directly from the border to third countries. Uh, this implies that third countries play along much more than they do right now. Uh, but from everything that we know from the last 20 years from literature, it's not automatic that just a bit more pressure, a bit more money will be really a game changer in the way that third countries cease to use migration cooperation. Uh, and uh, a big increase of numbers is a very optimistic estimate on part of the Commission. Uh, so uh, I'm coming already to the end. Uh, I think from the Commission's perspective, it's like this, uh, everybody should do a little bit more and according to the preferences that the member state has. So a more liberal member states uh, engage more on relocation, uh, more restrictive minded member states more on a return, return as a missing po uh, piece for a pan-European migration management system uh, in which everybody cooperates, everybody uh, uh, contributes according to own interests and preferences. It's clearly a real politic approach, so acknowledge the preferences of Eastern Europe, seeing that the negotiations for years and years after the crisis, they have led to nowhere. Uh, so uh, it's an explicit attempt to again bring them in uh, and uh, make it uh, happen. Uh, is this likely to, uh, to succeed? There is a high risk of continued politicization that the whole politicization shifts then from the relocation to the transfer obligation, uh, a process that is already happening to some extent. There is also quite a high risk that uh, the negotiations are very polarized, but the outcomes uh, are unsatisfactory once it's uh, adopted, because there's so much room and so much, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, leverage, or not leverage, uh, so much unclear points that really states that do not want to cooperate, they are very likely to find some ways to not cooperate in de facto as well. Uh, and then the final point, it's, it's, it's a difficult concept for migrants, uh, seeing that it potentially creates new vulnerabilities, and for partner states, seeing the expectations that they have vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, or from on the sides from the European Union. I will stop here. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, uh, Florian, for that uh, great uh, introduction. Already uh, very interesting insights already that we can uh, uh, run down through. Um, before I ask my questions, I would again remind the audience that we're uh, happy to have any questions that you have, so please feel free to to, to send those uh, to us in the in the chat box. Um, 
yeah, we've already covered uh, quite a few topics already that are, you know, really interesting and fascinating and come up and, and bring up some of the issues with the, with the pact. Um, my first question is on responsibility sharing. Um, you know, you, you discussed this already in your paper and, uh, you know, one of the conclusions that you also draw is that the existing conflicts between member states over responsibility sharing is not going to be settled, but we rather transfer uh, this discussion to, you know, returns. Um, I, I want to know if, um, yeah, my question is, do you foresee this discussion merely carrying on? Uh, you, you briefly also mentioned Hungary, for example. Um, how do we then see the discussion playing out? I mean, Hungary is a very difficult nut as well, because when you see the public re reactions of the Orban regime, of the Orban government after the, the publication of the back the set, uh, they have come uh, basically already a bit to our way, but uh, we don't really see ourselves in this pact because what we strive for is not that a single migrant is entering the EU's territory. So all the things that the EU is asking for the EU should be actually taking place in third countries. There should be uh, centers and no one should end, uh, should come into the European Union. So it's a very, still a very different perception of mm -hmm. what migration policy should, uh, should lead to. Uh, and it's very difficult what you hear in the negotiations uh, to actually uh, combine uh, this perception with the perception of other member states. So Turkey is very open in its opposition. Uh, Turkey is certainly probably a case in extremis, uh, but it's, it's a bit, you know, it's not completely outside. It's also followed by some other member states. There are Pol Poland and, and even Denmark, Austria. They are also very, very critical to some of these responsibility sharing obligations there. Uh, and I mean, it's basically really a continuation of what we have before. Uh, and it's in a way questioning more fundamentally if there should be a European say in what responsibilities are for member states. Uh, and in a way, the perception that these states have is that this should not go beyond voluntary contributions. I mean, they can send a bit, you know, of support, material, personnel to Frontex basically and the rest should be really up to member states. So there is a, a very uh, uh, fundamentally different narrative and perception, and it's very difficult to bring this together with what uh, uh, you know, is the situation in new border states that are being expected to stick much more closer to the European Union law as they did before. So in former times, you saw it in the slide as well, uh, the number of asylum applications increased were very low, because Greece and the migrants basically converged in the interest of not being registered and not have, submitting an asylum application in Greece. The migrants wanted to go further north and the Greece didn't want to be responsible for all the asylum applications. Right now, this may be more difficult for, for Greece and Italy because they, they cannot you know, uh, get out of this obligation so easily, uh, but this uh, will only become acceptable for them if this responsibility element is working, which I believe is very difficult. And you uh, briefly mentioned uh, Frontex already, which is, an, which is you know, a topic I, I want to uh, ask you about uh, later on. But, but interestingly, what I find in what you mentioned here now as well is this need for a collective response uh, and that actually, you know, bordering states previously benefited from, uh, from not having a codified framework of how, how we're managing migration. Um, I think it's also interesting that you mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a diverging approach to uh, what migration governance should be. Uh, and, it's and it made me think of uh, what was the narrative uh, prior to the migration uh, crisis. Uh, and how have we shifted from there to now? Um, you know, of course, you've, you've mentioned that now we have to have kind of a codified approach. But I want you perhaps to take us back to, uh, you know, the Dublin principle. How have we moved from the Dublin principle to now? Uh, and how do we see the, the pact uh, playing off of that and how it perhaps diverges or converges with some of those principles? Sorry, we can't hear you. 
No, I, I think it's really interesting to take a bit more this historical perspective. So Dublin, yeah. the key principle is the first country within the EU that enters in contact with an asylum seekers is in, in charge of his or her asylum application. Mm -hmm. This brings a lot of responsibility to the border states. Uh, so a question that many people have right now is why did Greece and Italy uh, accept the Dublin regulation at first instance? Mm -hmm. There are different responses to this. So the Dublin Convention was signed in 1990. 1990. Mm -hmm. so it was a very different context. Uh, and it seems that the Italian and the Greek authorities back then, they were not so much aware of uh, migration flows increasing to such an extent from south. It was much more in the context of the fall of the communist regime. Uh, and Dublin was very much discussed uh, with regard to Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. And then later on with Eastern enlargement that the Eastern European states should take more responsibility for migrants coming from Eastern Europe. This was the one uh, uh, explanation, uh, uh, basically an underestimation of what the salience would become later mm -hmm. on. Uh, and the second one, that there was a clear linkage between Schengen and Dublin. Right. No Schengen, no internal border-free regime, if you don't accept more responsibilities uh, on the asylum field. And I think this was very uh, much the case for, uh, for Italy, uh, in which it was communicated, uh, look, this is basically your entry ticket for Schengen. Yeah. Uh, you have to accept Dublin as well. Uh, Dublin was never uh, very much loved by the southern member states. Yeah. If you look uh, historically, this uh, uh, discourse on solidarity is a very old one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, very, the difference is that it really increased so much more in salience uh, be because you know, numbers went up a bit and, and then uh, it was used by populist uh, parties, exaggerating it. So it become much more centered to the to migration policy making than it used to be, let's say, in the early 2000s. Uh, interesting how a negative uh, conditionality in this case uh, worked to, uh, you know, to push solidarity. Um, we've, uh, we've you also talked about, you know, the human rights and safeguarding issues with the, with the pact. Um, I found it really interesting that you brought up, for example, that even with this solution, there's still a choice for member states to have their own criteria on, uh, on, on who they're letting in and who they're actually returning. And already this, uh, this preference list that, that exists already with the kind of migrants uh, countries are taking in. We know, for example, that Germany was really, really good in taking in um, uh, uh, you know, refugees from the Syrian crisis. Um, but then again, they're on, you know, juxtaposed to that is a lot of, for example, African migrants that are still, uh, you know, in, in Calais, for example, uh, and there we see kind of a preference uh, and, and differential treatment. Um, I, I kind of want you to go into the, the human rights, um, you know, uh, circumstances uh, for migrants uh, that are going to be contributed by the new pact. Um, and, and note, and especially uh, the issue of uh, departure, transit uh, from, from, you know, receiving countries uh, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, can't hear you. I always switch it off because otherwise there's a small echo, but I know, I mean, in the academic literature, there's quite some debate if the European Union's migration policies contribute to a downgrading of existing mm -hmm. human rights standards mm -hmm. or to the contrary if the EU's the EU generally is a kind of a safeguard for the protection of human rights viewed the very restrictive practices of certain member states mm -hmm. so you see it's it's a it's a different thing you know some say that uh, the EU's policies and the pact would here fall in line with uh, uh, so, uh, with some previous laws, they basically, they get all, ever more restrictive, ever more focus on border control, quick returns, accelerated procedures. Uh, so the EU is contributing to a downgrading of human rights and the pact would here basically fall in a, in a wider picture. Uh, but I think uh, all of the elements that the pact is having here right now, for instance, a much stronger focus on accelerated procedures, they do it already in some member states since many years. So the real human rights challenges in Europe have come as well 
from probably the fact that EU's migration policy is not very much harmonized. It's harmonized very much on paper, but not in practices. Uh, and some member states have right now had very or quite restrictive minded member states, uh, uh, governments, and they have really experimented with how far they can go with the restrictive practices. Uh, and, and here we have seen that the European Union sometimes has actually served as a, as a liberal constraint for this member mm -hmm. state. There, there were NGOs bringing cases to the European Court of, of Justice uh, with regard to the returns directive. The returns directive is a very interesting case. The returns directive, initially it was very much uh, uh, pushed against by NGOs saying mm -hmm. it's very restrictive, mm -hmm. it's very much easily possible, all these kind of things. But what happened right now, it was adopted in 2008. Uh, it has become one of the key references for NGOs yeah. when asking uh, member states to not be too restrictive. You know, So they said, you know, there are certain minimum standards you cannot undergo uh, and there uh, you, uh, you, you have to refer it. So the, the European Court, uh, the ECG, so the, right now it's called, no, no, European Court, no, Court of the European Union. Court of Justice of the European Union, if that's the correct title right now, uh, has become as a kind of a, a, a real important referent for protecting human rights together with the Strasbourg-based Court on Human Rights. Uh, so uh, that's a bit, it's a wider focus what I'm saying here, but I think the pact you can understand a bit in this as well. Uh, I think it's it's going uh, in, in, a, in a direction in which member states have been going a certain but an ever-growing group of member states. Uh, it's, it has relatively restrictive, relatively problematic elements. Mm -hmm. uh, the European Union, the Commission tried to make a balance in the sense that it includes also some aspects that have been long-standing aspects of NGOs. So there should be also accelerated procedures for uh, obvious refugees, you know? I mean, if you're a woman, if you have children and you come from Syria, it should be very easy for you or easier than it is right now to get uh, asylum status in the European Union. So the commission tries to go both way, uh, but some of the ways in particular in the restrictive end, uh, I think they're not unproblematic, but they do reflect what some member states have already been trying for some time. I, uh, I see two things, uh, you know, that you've mentioned here. On the one hand, it's almost like we're, you know, restrictive member states, uh, you know, that were restricted before are kind of having, would you say, perhaps even a renewed mandate, um, you know, to continue on this path. I think, for example, the screening procedures that have been proposed uh, on the one hand, you know, could, could be our good good on the part of migrants uh, whose situation is dire and, and, you know, needs immediate attention. Um, but I also foresee this, you know, to kind of go along the securitization um, theme. Um, you know, but that aside, I, 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 I really much wonder on the practicality and the feasibility of, you know, even uh, accelerated procedures. We've talked about uh, uh, trying to have more reception centers, for example, uh, in the in the in the fear or or in the deter in the deterrence of having a new moria. Um, to what extent do you think it's actually feasible to have? Uh, you know more reception centers um, with these with these uh, screening procedures or with these you know modernized procedures. Uh, don't these two contradict each other when we have two very different approaches among member states? I mean, what is happening right now in Greek in the Greek islands? Uh, it's relatively well known. I mean, there are three or four times as many migrants as reception places, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So conditions are relatively dire, uh, but uh, and at the same time, there's a lot of money being spent on Greece and and on the and the asylum field. So I think it's really a question of political will. Uh, mm -hmm. If you would like to make uh, the situation better, uh, you could do it also directly on the on the Greek islands right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the situation is that. Greece, but also some other member states, they see uh, uh, more interest at this moment to make this deterrent strategy so that migrants communicate back to their community that it's not yes. worthwhile coming. Uh, yeah. so the political will uh, to have the situation as it is uh, in order to deter further migrants from coming. 
Uh, and uh, I think this will continue also with the new pact. I mean, if you, if you want to keep this message going, yeah. you, don't, you know, you don't uh, have uh, much better systems there, probably slightly better, but not much to, uh, to have the, the whole system there uh, to have this deterrence effect. So this is the, the one thing. And this is accelerated procedure. And here we're coming a bit already to this external dimension. Yeah. Depends very much how third countries will react to the EU's policy yeah. if they are more and more willing to uh, uh, to play along the EU's priorities, in particular, uh, implying that they don't let migrants deparking very very Europe, or if they do, uh, to take them back relatively quickly. That's a that's a key question here. Yeah, really good that you mentioned this uh, externalization uh, um, aspect of, of the new pact. And we kind of see that this, this trend, as you mentioned already, that, you know, instead of, uh, you know, going to the challenges of political will, for example, to have these mechanisms within European uh, borders, we're, we're kind of leaning towards externalization. But before I talk on the topic uh, of externalization, I, I'm really curious to your take on um, the scrutiny of actors uh, involved uh, in migration governance. We've seen, for example, that Frontex has come under fire for, uh, you know, again, human rights violations. Uh, but at the same time, it is gaining more powers as well to, you know, to govern uh, migration. Um, to what extent do we see you know, space for uh, administrative support that is not tainted in, in human rights violations. Um, we've seen talk in the, in the parliament of uh, saying, you know, Frontex is a really important uh, instrument and should uh, be depoliticized as, uh, you know, this institute that's doing the work that it needs to do. Um, but to, to what extent, yeah, do, do we see um, more support uh, without avoiding uh, more of the same, so to say. Yeah, I mean, Frontex, Frontex has become quite under fire from NGOs uh, and uh, the parliament. Uh, and, and it's true, I mean, it was Bellinc Bellincat in the beginning who mm -hmm. exactly showed how Frontex boats were also involved in this pushback operations. Uh, but if you look really how accountability is created within Frontex, yeah. uh, you may see, or you may assume uh, that it will not necessarily lead to Frontex changing their behavior very quickly, because the management board of Frontex, which is after all responsible also for management and for steering, it's very much dominated by member states. The commission has uh, very little say there. Mm -hmm. Member states, uh, I mean, here you can also open up the, a wider perspective, but governments, you know, they see uh, the migration theme, in particular irregular migration, uh, asylum, primarily through the prism of numbers. Yeah. Uh, their key interest is really what are the numbers, and that's how the, the, the public discourse is right now. It's very monofocused on numbers, you know, how many applications are there, how many are coming. Uh, so what Frontex is doing <laughs> it causes a backlash in the European Parliament, but in the member states, I don't think that they are necessarily so, you know, or many member states, I don't want to say mm -hmm. all the member states are so critical about it, you know, they say, you know, I mean, Frontex is doing what they are, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose, they control very strictly, don't let in, you know, so I don't expect that uh, uh, there will be a lot of, or the same amount of pressure uh, in the management board on Frontex actually uh, uh, changing behavior. And you see it right now, if you just look at the media or the European Parliament. The European Parliament has the power of the purse. Uh, and I think they announced it right now, they will use it to, to yeah. push for a yeah. different approach. Uh, but here again, uh, we have to see if they will really stick to it throughout because also uh, center right, uh, you know, far right. Politics uh, plays a part. Yeah, so it's, it's a question if they will go. I mean, if the European Parliament wants to go this way, this is certainly a, a way to do it. Uh, I wouldn't hope too much on the management board to put pressure there that this will right now be followed up very stringently. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I guess it's both of us looking forward to uh, to this report and what's what's going to be done with the with the results. Uh, very much from a human rights perspective, we hope, of course, to have more and more language uh, included, uh, let alone having more monitoring mechanisms to, to the functioning uh, of the institution. Um, lastly, we come to, I think, what is uh, an exciting and kind of a futuristic view of, of where we see that the pact or migration or European migration governance is going. And this is the topic of policy externalization. Um, or, or, you know, border accelerations. You briefly talked about the challenges that member states are facing and uh, having a consensus on how we how we approach and how we manage migration within European borders. Uh, and as a solution, we've seen that, for example, the uh, EU TF has gotten a lot of attention and, uh, you know, a lot of talk of, of having more, more emergency funding to address the root causes of irregular migration and displaced persons, notably in Africa, for example. Um, I one of the issues that I think is really critical, really important to to flag on the topic of externalization is um, that this is a new negotiation table that we're you know we're coming to seat at. I feel on the one hand there is an assumption um, that. Uh, you know, Europe, European bargaining power uh, is, is has much more leverage than receiving or transition or tra transit states. Um, but could you perhaps, uh, you know, uh, give your opinion on what you think this bargaining, these bargaining positions are going to play a role in, uh, in return receiving uh, states? Uh, notably also uh, perhaps contradicting priority uh, issues. Uh, among among our um, transit and uh, migrant sending states. Yeah, it's also a good question here. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's discussed in a bit of a simplistic way. You know, the EU, a, lot, a rich and powerful organization, mm -hmm. is able to uh, to impose basically its priorities, its demand on some. You know, I mean, weaker states, economically speaking, and so on. But in the literature as well, in the academic literature, it's, it's often called as reversed conditionality. It's basically the states, key states of transit or origin, they come to the EU and they set their demands, you know, I, I need this and that uh, for me to either control better my borders or take a certain number of migrants back. Uh, so it's the, the bargaining structures, they are, uh, they are not so clear cut and some states such as Morocco, they have become really skilled in, mm -hmm. in you know, shift either playing member states or the European Union level, uh, and they they get out uh, a quite uh, close uh, or quite strong rewards in terms mm -hmm. of political things. What they have, we did, we did once a research on West Africa and what are their own interests in migration policy, mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting to see that it's more complicated as well. They don't have necessarily the same interests all uh, all the actors there you know i mean in ghana and senegal we found that for instance political and administrative actors they do diverge quite a bit yeah. so administrative actors the you know bureaucracies high level you know they are very happy with the money that the eu is offering there yeah. they sometimes even you know they implement the the border controls and they they are even more open to cooperate and return Whereas political actors, they, in particular in democracies, they face huge pressure not to cooperate with the EU yeah. on very yeah. visible things. And visible things are always the return issue. Give an example in the Gambia. Gambia was a country in West Africa that became de more democratic in 2016. Mm -hmm. There was a government wanted a better relationship with the European Union. They accepted to cooperate more in return. Then they did so, but then there was one big uh, flight full of returnees to Gambia, uh, and there was really mass manifestations. There was street riots, and mm. then stopped. You know, there was a huge pressure on politicians to stop again, and then they stopped the return cooperation with the EU again, saying, you know, it's it's impossible. We have too much opposition there. So it's it's there. It's 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 a lot of pressure on these governments not to cooperate with the EU. Uh, the EU has much uh, easier inroads into administrative actors and the civil society is a, is a discussion on its own there. They are either fully opposed, but there are also some who are much more open to cooperation. 
So we, we definitely see a pushback and, you know, different dynamics in, uh, in receiving uh, states. And also really good to, to remember that, uh, you know, receiving states are, uh, are not passive. Um, and there, that there, there are different political dynamics in, in each of these states. Um, you, you mentioned earlier uh, negative conditionalities perhaps being, being also used uh, to, you know, to gain compliance, especially when we're talking about funding uh, as an incentive. Uh, how do you see this impacting, again, this political sphere uh, in, 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 sending, in sending and transitioning states? Yeah, negative conditionality, the EU is often referring right now to the visa field. So right. saying that a state who is not cooperating on return, irregular migration, then they will all have negative consequences, either more expensive, more difficult visas or mm -hmm. just certain categories that the elites, the diplomats, they cannot come in so easily. Uh, I mean, that's, that will be, that's already possible. The visa code basically was already changed. But it's politically very, very sensitive because it's a it's it's a strong foreign policy signal, uh, and uh, ministers of interior they may want to do it because they are very much focused on irregular migration control return issues. But the diplomats <laughs> they are very reluctant to use this instrument. I mean, think of a key state, France. France has a huge counterterrorist uh, operation in the Sahel. Uh, they are really dependent on, you know, uh, uh, on, on a close cooperation with uh, states such as Mali, but also Chad and all the, the states in the, in the region. They are very reluctant to use or to just to use the, the EU, you know, implement or to let the EU implement a much stricter visa regime only for the migration field without considering other foreign or security considerations that the EU has in this region. Uh, and this is uh, it's just one example. I mean, you have Italy, you have Spain, they have very close relationship with some states in, in Africa as well. It's very difficult uh, to make uh, all of the states agree to actually use the toolbox that the EU has at its disposal with regard to negative conditionality there. Uh, before uh, we forget uh, to include our uh, our uh, audience's views, I have uh, perhaps one question that I would like to ask you before we close this discussion. Uh, and it, and one of our uh, audience members, uh, Gemma, uh, refers to, uh, for example, per, perhaps uh, alternative burden sharing uh, approaches. Um, she asks, um, forcing EU member states that have not been very forthcoming in burden sharing of migration and asylum challenges in uh, Europe. It's interesting to see that the focus on the new pact is on returns, and it strikes me that there's no attempt to think about economic and financial incentives for EU member states willing to take on migrants and asylum seekers and create training programs, for example, to uh, integrate uh, See, and create yeah training programs integrate them into labor markets when we consider gloomy democratic future in Europe would this be an approach that could could perhaps foster more uh, collective uh, yeah solidarity sharing yeah first let me say hello to Gemma nice to see that she made it here uh, and it's a very good question uh, I think uh, in some member states, actually, there are these kind of attempts, uh, Germany being one, uh, in which there are ex explicit effort to make it a bit easier mm -hmm. for uh, asylum seekers to integrate in the, in, the, uh, in, in the labor market. In some other states, uh, uh, it's much more difficult. Uh, I know, for instance, uh, the Austrian case. In Austria case, they had... Uh, uh, several asylum seekers finishing a kind of a, an, a, a formation, you know, bakery, whatever, uh, and still, you know, they were they were required. The labor, uh, the their employees asked to stay there, and they were all returned once they became eighteen, uh, so full yeah. age, and they had no longer the right to stay. So, uh, so it was really a, a political signal. So it, here again, you know, it's it depends on the. Uh, on uh, how member states view the perspective and here right-wing governments uh, they tend to to be not so open to use this kind of uh, labor incentives 
uh, to, to take in migrants. I mean, basically, if you talk to people from the Ministry of Interior, they always say, we are even open to migration, but never underestimate that or, or never mix asylum and migration field. Asylum is something very different. And then if we start using labor incentives there, it's, they always use the term pull factor. It will create mm -hmm. a pull factor for more people to come. So that's why uh, they are so reluctant to use uh, to use it or to, to use this kind of thinking uh, in the in the uh, in the field of asylum. Uh, it it would certainly make sense. Uh, and I mean, I don't want to be too gloomy myself here because what we have seen in the COVID nineteen uh, crisis uh, that we saw quite some regularization programs being implemented in some member states. Uh, Italy, for instance, uh, you saw that uh, many parts of the economy do depend on migration. Yeah. And this may, may lead, after all, to, uh, to a, a more political willingness to use it. I think, I think it's really just a question of political will there, yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, Italy and, uh, and political will, um, Sylvia, one of our uh, viewers in the audience uh, on Italy specifically asked, um, in Italy, the accelerated processes have already been in practice and it has actually increased uh, arbitrary forms of detention of foreign citizens and is and in a lack of respect of migrants' rights. Again, we, we talked about the human rights uh, consequences. Um, Will we see more of, of the same thing? Um, we've talked about, uh, you know, political will in, in different member states being uh, differential, entry being differential. Um, and particularly when return, uh, you know, so-called retur return migrants are not willing to, to go back. Uh, what do you foresee for member state level uh, and, how, and, how, and how member states are going to deal with this? Yeah, I think here you could almost be philosophically a bit. Human rights are always as strong as a society permits it to be, you know. And if there is a general, you know, if parties are gaining, you know, a dominance in the public narrative that this, you know, rights, they use the rights only to get benefits or to abuse what they're there, then the, the respect of these rights gets more difficult. So I think it's very good. Uh, what you write here, that you inform authorities. I think there, uh, there has to be a kind of a societal response to this kind of policies to, uh, to change them. Uh, it's not necessarily only because there are a few new laws at European Union level that uh, these practices will completely alter in one way or another. I think it's always a bit embedded. I, I think indeed that if the BECT gets adopted, these accelerated procedures they may gain legitimacy, they gain, mm -hmm. become more uh, widespread. So it's, it's certainly a bit more problematic because accelerated procedures, they often are based on very rough selection criteria, mm -hmm. based on nationalities, you know, you are from a safe nationality because I don't know, you're coming from a country in which uh, you can, you know, you can go to other areas to be safe, this kind of thing. So it's, it's relatively problematic already. Uh, but uh, I think to counter it, really, it, there has to be a societal, local uh, 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 response and pressure, a, a certain counter narrative that, that is getting, you know, uh, heard in the, in the public discourse. Yeah. It seems, uh, you know, the, one of the conclusions that we draw from this discussion is that it's really necessary that member states uh, at a national level uh, you know, gain consensus on how to deal with migration. Uh, you know, I think you've also briefly mentioned the involvement of civil society, for example, and the importance of shaping our narratives on uh, on migration policy. Um, I think we're we're coming to an end of our of our discussion. And again, I'd like to I'd like to thank um, 
the, the audience for joining us. Uh, we will have a video recording of this uh, coffee conversation available for people to, to rewatch. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to follow us on our platforms uh, for, and for all the upcoming conversations that we're going to have on uh, more and more interesting topics. Of course, we cover more than just migration. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, uh, to see you all there. Please follow us again on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and on Facebook at Path for Europe. And uh, contact us with any questions perhaps that you, that you might have for Florian or for me myself. Um, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Florian, again, for making time in your busy schedule to, to discuss this uh, very relevant topic with us. The thanks goes fully from my side. It was great being with you and engaging with you in the discussion. To all of you and Shibuya to you in particular, certainly. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye.